Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. Where I have been a busy boy, I spent the last day out in the field, and I went and got some berries so we wouldn't have to spend so much time this episode looking for food. I think I have them in a basket somewhere. I hope I do. There they are. And in the process, I found a couple things that I wanted to show and explore with you guys. First, I found and marked some different kinds of wild crops we can look at and harvest. And I went and took a quick peek at this gray thing on the map here, and it was what I thought it was. So we're going to explore that today. But first, I noticed something when I opened my character screen. Down in the environment, we have current rift activity very high. This ties back into the rust world and the drifters. And in fact, I can kind of see through the window. Do you see that black and brown lightning kind of thing in the distance? That is a rift, and I think we can get a better view of it from here. No, we can't. We can't see a darn thing. As of version 1.16, rifts are how drifters spawn into the world on the surface outside of what are called temporal storms. Now, rifts themselves don't hurt you, but getting close to them causes your temporal stability to drain very rapidly. I don't see any more out here either. And, of course, if you're close, uh, the drifters can then spawn all around you. They present a second danger, which is when your temporal stability gets very low, drifters can spawn nearer and nearer to you, and more powerful drifters can also spawn. So, this episode may be a little bit dangerous, and we may end up way back where we started over on that forest on a cliff. We'll see how this goes. So, to protect ourselves, we're going to need a few more things than we already have. We have three spears, and they're pretty good, but when we throw them, although they're powerful, we have to go and pick them up every time we throw them. So, if we hit an enemy that's far away, or we miss, and we end up out of spears, we could end up in a bit of a pickle. On top of that, we have no armor, and our options today are quite limited, but we're going to get whatever we can to make ourselves more survivable in combat. And do you hear that right now? I hear that, and I see this little buddy trying to get through the wall toward us. This is one of those drifters. Because, oh my, he spawned very close by. Do you see that right there? I'm going to make a little pillar here. And there's a little sparkle. I can just see it. You might not be able to. There are several. There's one right there over the cursor. One right there over the cursor. Yeah, this is a very dangerous night. So we might end up sleeping through the night when we're working through it. And we're going to stay down here because drifters, as of version 1.16, they have learned to throw stones. Someone, I guess, opened them up, cracked their skulls up open, and inserted some brains into their heads. So they can't really see us beyond, behind this wall here, although they know where we are. But they can't get to us at the moment. So we're going to go ahead and make some armor. And the only armor we have right now is called makeshift armor. For that, we're going to need nine pieces of grass, which we have 21 right here. And we're going to need a whole bunch of firewood. And I'm going to go ahead and just turn most of this, say half of this, into firewood. I think that should be enough. So if we take the firewood and place it in a U here, and we put grass here, and we take our knife, what's left of it, we can make improvised body armor. Now this stuff is awful. It has 75 durability, which is not bad against these surface drifters, but against things like wolves, it's pretty terrible. And the reason is because at the bottom there, you'll see protection tier zero. The attack and damage tier of your weapons and armor have an effect on how much armor that gets, gets torn through. So if you are hit with a tier 1 attack and you're wearing tier 0 armor, your armor is going to take extra durability and it won't protect from as much damage. And the higher the tier of the attack against your armor is, the worse it gets. But it's what we have for now. And if we run into drifters or out there, or even a wolf, it might save our life. The second thing that we're going to make is, if some of you noticed uh, in the previous episode, I kind of made a bow. I was going somewhere with that when I realized we were starving and I ended up not doing anything with it. So we already have a bow, and I made that by taking several cattails, and I was able to make three rope. 
with that rope. I place them in a roughly bow-shaped format, like that, and then three rope here on the side, and I got this bow. Very unique crafting recipe. I'm sure you've never seen it before. Anyway, we're also going to need some arrows to fire with that, and arrows are made, at least in the early game, with flint arrowheads. And so we're going to get knapping again. I think we're going to make about 30 arrows because the arrows don't deal a ton of damage. This bow deals three piercing damage, and I think the arrows are actually going to either deal zero or maybe even point, negative point two five damage. So they won't deal a lot of damage, and we'll need a ton of them if we're going to kill anything. So let's get napping. We pick our arrowhead, and we just spend a thousand years doing this. And with all that napping out of the way, we have 36 arrows, and you'll see that I made a flint spearhead by accident, which is fine. More spears are always great, but since we have such limited inventory, I don't want to keep it on me. But if I tuck it away in one of these baskets, it might get a bit lost. So I'm going to put it on the wall. And to do that, we can make a tool rack with three sticks along the top and three on the bottom. Makes one tool rack. And I'm going to put this right by the door so that I can grab the spear if I need to. Each tool rack has four locations for holding objects. Top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. And it's a simple right click to add or remove. To put these arrows together, we'll need these sticks and we'll need the arrows. And these make crude arrows. Ah, negative 0.75 damage. Even worse than I thought. If we had feathers, this would be reduced to, I believe, negative 0.25 damage, but it's what we have. So I'm going to make 30 of these, I think. And we'll keep the rest of the sticks in case we need them. And we'll put these flint arrowheads away. And I think I'm going to sleep for the rest of the night because we might be able to, one, get these guys to go away without having to harm anybody. And hopefully, oh, our activity is calm already. Well, then maybe we could uh, have a bit of a rumble, huh? Well, it seems like in the time it took me to get ready, he went away on his own. So we are going to go to sleep and get to morning. And we're going to really hope that it is still nice and calm. And good morning. Oh, a nice bright day. You'd love to see it. Oh, and there's no rain either. Even better. Let's go ahead and have a bit of breakfast. There we go. Grab that, and we're going to just chow down on these berries. And I think we'll take the rest of them with us. And you, as you can see, it takes a lot of berries to fill you up. So we want to empty our inventory before we go. We'll leave the extra arrowheads here, but we'll keep the arrows. We've got our sticks. I'm not sure we need the grass right now. And I'm going to bring along these birch seeds. I want to plant them before we go anywhere. And I'm also going to make a fresh knife. I'll bring it back when that's done. Okay, and away we go on a small adventure with some meat waiting for us when we get home. Perfect. Let's take a quick hike over to this area over here. Here's our little pointer here. So we're going to hit all these little blue things. I was not able to pick them up when I was out gathering berries. And I also wanted to sh just show you what these things look like out in the wild. But before we get anywhere, we're going to stop and we're going to plant these birch seeds. Break this grass. Oh crouch and right click to plant that. It'll make a little pile and in three days it'll sprout into a little sapling and then about I think five to eight days after that it'll sprout into a full tree or should say grow into a full tree. And we'll give these some separation like that. Perfect. Okay let's continue on our journey and we have a decently open inventory. And I left the other knife that I made back on the weapon rack just to save some inventory space. And I left our door open because things aren't really going to wander in there, and if we need to hustle in there, we don't, we don't want to have to open the door and potentially break it again. I just heard another growl. Maybe that growly boy is back. 
maybe he's not. Okay, so over here we have some carrots. So these are also not fully grown. But you see they have uh, two rows of four. And we're going to go ahead and break them and see if we get a seed. We didn't. Shame. Now these don't ever regrow as far as I know. I have done some experimentation with them in the past. And I don't... Ooh! Oh my! Ooh. Oh my! Well, there's two of them. That suddenly happened. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Eat spear, buddy. Don't be throwing stones at me. Ow. You hurt. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Well, that was a shock. I did not see them coming. Where did they even come from? Holy cow. Whew. Blood pressure 5,000 over 6,000. Well, we can go ahead and we can harvest these like they're animal by crouching and holding right click. This is actually pretty good because sometimes these drifters will carry the parts that we need to set our spawn. And those little particles gave me another heart attack. <laughs> I thought it was another drifter. <laughs> Sneak up on me. Okay. Back to what we're doing. So let's go check out the rest of these vegetables. What do we have here? Nothing. I fooled myself. I'll take these stones. We'll want them later. There's a reason I'm collecting all the stones I come across, and we'll get to that in a minute. And we have onions. Oh boy. Onions are a nice crop for a very specific reason. Is that most crops are very attractive to the local fauna, namely rabbits. However, certain crops, specifically rice, onions, and pumpkins, in addition to most of the newer southern crops, rabbits will ignore. And here, because we're breaking these that are at stage six out of seven, they're dropping one or two onions, in this case one, and the seeds. And the, the higher the growth stage, the more likely you are to get seeds. We're gonna go ahead and we'll break all of these as many seeds as we can. Oh, that was very generous. And we will mark this off our map. Now, I am currently deleting these waypoints. There are some times when I prefer to change the color of the waypoint, usually to black to indicate that something's empty. But in the case of these, since they do not respawn and they're not scattered in a specific pattern, I do typically just delete them. More stones. And over here we have some more mature rye, which I found some of yesterday while I was looking for mushrooms and utterly failing to find any. So let's grab these. And they give a pretty good amount of rye grain when you break them. And we have a pretty good rye collection there. Let's mark that off. And looks like we have one more way out here that I must have stumbled across. Ah, here we go, more flax. And some berry bushes, which I think I already readed. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm holding those berries from those. Okay, three seeds, not too bad. And I don't see any other crops in the immediate vicinity. Mark that off. And we do have one more. It looks like it's turnips. Okay, great. Let's go check out this circle here. And as I'm sure you can see right there, it is a ruined tower of some sort. Ruins on the surface of Vintistory are a pretty common sight, although some areas may have them more than others. But you're sure to run across them if you do any exploring whatsoever in the game. And they are a valuable source of many things. One, is that they are a good early game source of granite cobblestone if you're looking for some nice sturdy building blocks that aren't flammable. On top of that, most but not all of these have, and look here, we have one, they have a loot chest, or sorry, a loot vessel. Cracked vessels are similar to storage vessels that you can make as a player, but they're cracked, meaning they're, you know, they're damaged, and you can't move them unless you happen to be a malefactor, and even then you only have a small chance of doing anything with them. So all we can do, and this one says food, is we can break them and get whatever's inside. And you know what? Food is something we're very short on. Let's go ahead and break this. And we got a whole bunch of, I think that's spelt. Yep, spelt green. 
So we have a pretty good store of Ryan Spell, and these will last for a very long while, even in our inventory. 90 days, that is almost a full year. And in a container, such as our baskets back home, they should last even longer. Now, one thing about cobblestone uh, specifically, and I think some other of the, the crafted stones, such as bricks, you don't need a pickaxe to break them. Actually, you can just break them with your hands if you want to. They take a little while, but if you need some early game building materials and have some time on your hands, you may as well just collect some of the blocks. We're going to leave the rest there for now. I'm not interested in cobblestone at the moment. But right down here we have what, something else that I'm looking for. Bony soil. I just heard trees rustle. I was a little nervous. Bony soil is a decorative soil block, but it also serves another purpose. There is a mechanic in the game called panning, where you take a pan and stand in some water and then sift through a block to get some goodies out of it. And bony soil indicates that somebody died there. So it's a little grim, sure, but you can get some good stuff by, you know, sifting through a dead person's pockets and whatever jewelry they happen to have. And also, underneath here, you're going to see more bony soil, oftentimes underneath these ruins. So it, it pays to dig around and see what you can find. And this is a, well, very generous ruin. So I'm going to dig these up, and we'll take them all back to our home. And I might make a quick snack of these red currants, and then I'll run back and grab those turnips, and we'll meet back home and talk about what to do with this bony soil. And on the way, I ran into some peat. So in the early game especially, it's important to mark everything you find that you think might be useful later, because it can be hard to find. If you look at the map and zoom in on where we are, you really can't tell that there's peat here just by looking at the color of the surface soil here. It used to be a little more pronounced, but now it's almost impossible to see. And in fact, here over here, I found some blue clay when I was exploring previously. And you can see that it's just a little bit lighter, but it's not very visible. So make a note to mark everything you see if you can't carry it at the time, and so you can come back to it later without having to search for it. And we're back home. But it's getting toward nighttime, so we're going to shift our focus from panning to a little bit of food prep. So I have sort of dedicated this basket over here, and I gave the reeds another shave here to make it. This is my dedicated seed bin. We're going to keep these here for now. It's not stacking, I don't know why. And we'll either plant them here or, since I don't want to settle here and I don't want to have to wait eight or nine days, you know, eight days, ten days, in order to be able to move, I want to just leave them here and we'll bring them with us when we go and find a permanent home. However, we did find some turnips. We've got four turnips, two onions, and a smattering of rye and spelt grain. We also have two raw bushmeat. Now, bushmeat is special in that you cannot use it in meals. It's kind of too gross and nasty and gamey and whatever to actually use in meals. So all we can do with that is cook it. So we're going to go ahead and do that because it's just going to spoil here if we don't use it. So let's grab a piece of wood, which I grabbed from our ground storage wood pile. Ground storage is a concept I have not brought up yet, but some things, in fact a lot of things, can be stored on the ground. Wood and most fuels are one of them. You can also store clay pots and planks and ingots and so on on the ground, and we'll, we'll do some of that later, but we don't have access to any of those now, so it's a moot point. Let's throw this wood on here, and we're going to swap hands to our main hand, light the fire, swap back, and throw the meat on. Now you can kind of babysit this, as I showed you in the previous episode, where the fire pit will remain hot for a good long while after the fuel is burned down. So if you babysit it, you can sit here and pull the wood out and wait for the fire pit to cool down for a bit before you put your wood back in. And as long as it's still above a certain temperature, as long as it doesn't say cold, really, your fire pit will relight. Basically, as long as this is still smoking a little bit. And see how it's got little puffs of smoke there, here and there? As long as it's still doing that, we can throw a piece of wood on, it will reignite, and it will start increasing temperature again. So let's go ahead and put that piece of wood on, because we'll need that to finish cooking this awful, awful bush meat, which I think we got from... I don't know where we got it from. Mystery meat. Yum. 
we will soon have access to better meals because we've been eating these ingredients one by one. Cooked meat, raw berries, and in some cases I think we were just munching on raw grain. So we want to get into some actual meal making. And to do that, we need to have something in which to cook. Because you can't just, well, I guess you could make a, a kebab or a shish kebab out of vegetables and so on, but you can't really do that in Vintage Story. Instead, we need to make some kind of cooking vessel. In our case, a cooking pot and some bowls in which to eat it. So we're going to get some of this clay, and we're going to get into the next big thing you can do with clay, which is clay forming. To do clay forming, get a big old hunk of clay in your hand, preferably half a stack or so, depending on what you're building. And you can crouch and right click, and you'll get this menu of things you can make. From shingles, to different molds, to uh, pots and planters and watering cans. Right now we are interested in a raw cooking pot. And then once you have the clay item on the ground and you're working on it, you can again hold alt to release your mouse from your viewpoint, and you can left click to remove voxels. We're going to do that here. And you can hold left click and drag it, and then you can also use right click to add voxels. And at the top of the screen, you'll see that there's a count. Each piece of clay in my hand is worth, I think, 20 voxels, except the first one is worth more. And it will keep a count of how many voxels you have on the current piece. And as you use them up, it will consume additional pieces from your hand. Now, this can be a slow process. Luckily, the developer has added in a feature where you can press a certain button that I need to figure out what it is on my keyboard again. Ah, there it is. I believe it is F for you folks using standard QWERTY keyboard layouts for right-handers. It is the Duplicate Layer button. This will duplicate the last layer that you personally built, and you can just hold it down. And this will speed up your process for making things, especially when they have tall walls. Now when you get to the top, it'll start putting voxels in the wrong place if the top is different from the rest of the thing. But we'll go ahead and fill in the rest of this cooking pot. And presto, we have a raw cooking pot. Now it's raw because it is still wet clay, basically. And in previous versions of the game, back in 1.14, you would just throw a clay pot into a fire pit to fire it and turn it into a hardened piece of ceramic. Well, no longer. The fire pit isn't realistic in, in the first place because you need a, a constant source of very high heat from all sides. So there's a new method for doing that in pit kilns. And we'll make a pit kiln just after we make our second object, which is going to be a set of four raw bowls. And there we have our bowls. Now it occurs to me that uh, one of these bowls is going to go unfired, but in order to fire clay items, you need to dig a pit. It doesn't need to be very big. One block will do. And we're going to pick a spot that is decently far from anything flammable, because pit kilns can and will burn down entire forests and nearly entire worlds. Now to place a clay object into a pit kiln, you need to crouch and right click. If you click at the center, it'll put it in the middle. But as of this version, you can now mix and match a lot of objects on the ground. So we're going to put it in the corner, and we'll fill in the rest of the pit kiln with these three bowls and we'll throw this one back in our storage for now. Next, we need a bunch of grass, sticks, and some firewood, or peat. And I think for now we're going to do firewood, because the benefit to peat isn't particularly huge. So we need to get, I believe it's 10 grass for a single piece of, or for a single pit kiln. And you take that grass, and you crouch, and you right click. So you can no longer right click. There we go. That is a pit kiln in the making. Next we need sticks, and we only have six sticks, so we're going to wander out this direction where I know we have some leaves and bushy leaves lurking, and we're going to go ahead and we're just going to chop down some of these leaves until we get some sticks. And now that we have our sticks, we go ahead and place a few of those on top here. So two clicks, and it uses, looks like, ten sticks, or was it eight? 
I wasn't counting. And then we need a few logs. I think it's eight, but it might just be four. Four it is, okay. So now we have a pit kiln. It needs to be fired. We'll drop these back here. And especially since it's rainy here and we know what f happens to fire in the rain in Vintage Story, we're going to build a little awning over this thing to keep the rain out of it. I don't think this extra plus shape is strictly necessary, but it makes me feel better. So we're going to go ahead and do the thing. I think I heard a growl. And there we have our first pit kiln. Now this will burn for about 24 hours, and then once it's done, we will have some finished product. So in the meantime, I think we need to get some more food in our bellies. We'll probably sleep, and then we'll go hunting, because I want some more meat to go along with these turnips and grains that we have. And we're out here at night, because I realized we were out of berries to eat. So... I wanted to show some of the interesting lighting that they get that they have in the game for nighttime. I don't think the sun's coming up yet because it's only 2.18 in the morning, but there must be something else going on in the sky that I don't know. Is it safe? Is it scary? It's probably scary. It's a vintage story. But I'm going to be out here looking for berries and other things to eat in the interim while we wait for our pit kiln to finish. The early game does have this sort of continuous game loop of constantly, constantly, constantly needing to eat and look for food. And the reason that we're making this uh, this pit kiln and looking for food to, to cook with it is that we're going to make a major upgrade in our food efficiency with it. Because normally when you eat your food, you just get the satiation and nothing else happens. And I spy some chickens over there. However, if you cook a meal, your satiation stops dropping for a set period of time. And that way, what might have been a five-minute holdover snack turns into a half an hour of not needing to worry about food. So we're going to go ahead, and I'm going to take aim at these chickens with this bow and try this thing out. And I got a chicken. All right, so it's still alive, so we'll hit it again. One down, one to go. Oh, he's angry. Yeah, you're dead. Sorry, buddy. Okay, cool. Well, this would be a good start to our meals. So, on my way back, with uh, having found a couple more turnips and some more spelt, and having helped myself to some local berry bushes, I'm seeing a rift in the distance. So I wanted to get a quick peek at it with you guys to sort of show you what they look like because they were impossible to see at night. But that is a rift, sort of that swirling brown goo with lightning coming out of it. And we want to kind of steer clear of those as much as we can. Now, rifts are somewhat predictable in that you can prevent them from showing up near your house with adequate lighting. I don't know what that means yet. I think that torches might be enough. I don't think that the oil lamps are, because they're very dim. I do spy between us and that rift. There is another ruin here that appears to be mostly buried. Here we go. We might come back later and dig this guy out, because there's going to be some more of that bony soil under us, which we have not yet gotten to today. So I just got home, broke the door. And that rift must have opened up, like, right as I was walking past it. Because I got home, turned around, and I saw it. And I had come right around that way. That's spooky. So we're going to get into some panning while we can. Hopefully no more rifts are going to open up near us. Ah, high rift activity. Well, we might wait that out. But we need to make us a panning tool... I think it's just called a panning pan. And that is made with a knife and a log. I'm going to pull that knife off over here. And I should note that one of the nice things about this is that you have free use of your mouse while you are in a menu. So if I want to place a block, I can grab it in my inventory, 
and I can place it or I can break it. I can even sort of invert the function of the Alt key because right now my mouse is unlocked. I can press Alt and now my mouse is locked back into my character viewpoint and I can move around. So let's go ahead and make ourselves a pan, not a club. There we go, a wooden pan. There we are. We'll settle in right here. And we're going to hope that we don't get too much good loot because we have no storage space. So let's go ahead and we'll hop in here. To pan, you have to be standing in water. It doesn't need to be very deep, just up to your waist is fine. And then you can place a block of things that are panable. In this case, we're going to do this bony soil. And I'm going to keep a very nervous lookout for these rifts, which seem to be causing havoc on my frame rate. Either that or being the water does. Take the pan, right click on it, you'll see the block gets shorter, and then right click on it again. And you'll pan. And you'll see that your baskets will shake whenever something drops into them. In this case, we got a bone. And we got nothing. And we got nothing. You will get a lot of nothing from these. There we go, we got some flax fibers. This is a great early game way to get bones, flax, candles, and even certain other higher tier things like pieces of tin bronze gear. And I see a rift just open up even closer to us, so we're going to finish painting this real quick. And we're going to hustle back inside, because we do not want to be here with that rift there. Whoop. Okay. I think we're going to wait this rift out and hopefully wait for the activity to go down. And maybe by then, our pit kiln will be finished firing. I'll bring y'all back when that's done. So, these rifts are still here. It's only been a few minutes. But I wanted to go over something that I brought up before, which is why I'm collecting all these shale stones. By combining the shale stones with a bit of fire clay, we have a couple options. If we ring them around the fire clay, or blue clay if we had any, we can get two shale cobblestone, just like the granite cobblestone that we harvested from that ruin. Or there's a nice sort of slate gray color. If we remove the corner one, we'll get cobblestone stairs. And if we remove all but the bottom row, we can make slabs. And this is what I'm after right now. Because I want to put a little bit of a roof on our house and we have a five by four footprint. So that means we're going to need a, at least a six by seven or 42 shale stones. But I might like a little bit of overhang. So I might go for seven by eight for 56. I'm gonna go ahead and make some of that and we'll start putting a bit of a roof on here. So, I maybe did the math a little bit wrong. We need an 8x9 roof, not a 7x8 roof. Oh well. We have a decent start, and it's well lit enough in here that nothing's going to spawn in here. I can take this ladder down. And I think now we'll start settling in and waiting for this rift activity to sort of blow over. So, I've been staring at these rifts for a little while, and I don't think they spawn drifters during the day. I could be wrong. So we might just die a horrible death, but let's finish up this lesson on panning. So bony soil is not the only thing you can pan. You can also pan sand and gravel. Now we only have sand, which is fine. But let's go ahead and go pan a block of sand and see what we get out of it. Let's go sit in the water here. Drop our sand down with a rift still in plain view. And let's give it a pan. And we'll see what we get. Ooh. 
we got our very first nugget of native copper. We will need a lot of this to get started on our way to the copper age, but for now, that's a neat little treasure to have. Let's go ahead and keep panning the rest of this block, and we'll just pan the whole thing out and see what we come up with. And that is one block of bunny soil and one block of sand panned. Sand and bunny soil each have different loot tables they pull from. Bunny soil typically has more personal treasures, rings, fibers from clothing, bones from people, whereas sand has typically more mineral items. And gravel has the same loot table as sand does. You can get some pretty good stuff this way, including early game access to some candles, which is really nice to have. But for now, we're going to squirrel this away, and we're going to keep waiting for our pit kiln to finish cooking up that clay for us. I may have to munch on some of this grain while we're waiting, but we will hopefully survive long enough to get our first real meal in our stomachs, and then we'll be so much happier. So after realizing I was being a bit of a weenie, I decided to brave it and I went outside and I panned the rest of that bony soil while watching that rift spin and warp right nearby. And we got some pretty cool goodies. Let's see what we got. So we got 12 bones. Eh, not awful. We got, and we already had two flax fibers from I believe that first one. We got five more for a total of seven. We got two copper arrowheads two flint arrowheads, a bunny rib cage, and then we got some real serious treasure here. We got two rough diamonds. Now, unlike certain other block games, diamonds are not used to make the higher tiers of armor. That would be things like iron and steel here. So they're not as useful as they are in other games, but these can be sold to certain traders for a pretty high price, and traders will give us more of these rusty gears. We got one rusty gear. This is the currency of Vintage Story. Now we won't be able to do much with one, but we will be able to find things to sell to traders and we'll also come across more rusty gears as we adventure. The last two things are the real cool stuff. We got a resonance archive, or a vinyl record if you will. Now we don't have the thing that we need to play this, and that's actually I think rarer than these discs are, but this is a neat thing to have. And lastly, we got a book. Books are the game's way of passing down lore to the player and telling the story of, of the game Vintage Story. To use a book, put it in your hand and right click. You get this kind of creepy dong sound. And if you hit J, you can see your journal. And I won't read this, but I will leave this on the screen for a minute so you can pause it and read it yourself if you want to. That, I think, is that for now. We still have that creepy thing outside. I am probably going to sleep and hope that our pit kiln is ready in the morning, as well as perhaps lower rift activity. Good morning. It is bright and early, 6 o'clock on a whatever day this is. And it looks like the rifts outside have cleared up. The activity still says hi, so that's a little worrying. I'd like to see a couple already reforming over there, but I step outside and it looks like our pit kiln is done. And now we have a cooking pot and three bowls. So now with these in hand, we can do the last thing that I wanted to cover in this episode is cooking, the real kind of cooking. In order to cook, you're going to right click on your fire pit, drop your cooking pot in there. And you'll see you'll get four more inventory slots up top. You can cook up to six meals at once, but they must all be the same meal. And the handbook itself has a good guide on meal making right here that will actually tell you how to make certain kinds of meals. Uh, I'm going to make a meat stew. So we need zero to two raw meat, vegetables, and maybe some fruit. I think we're out of fruit, so we'll probably just do meat and vegetables. So we're going to take some raw poultry, and we're going to take some, let's take some turnips, and we are going to go and put them in our soup pot, and we're going to split this so that we get the maximum amount of calories in our soup, even though it'll only give us two meals. 
So then we just throw our usual fire on there. Torch to light this thing. And then we get my favorite thing in this game. Let's sit close and watch and listen. I just love the bubbling of the pot and the clanking of the lid. Anyway, at this point, I'm going to take out this firewood because, again, this fire is already very hot, and this will definitely finish cooking with just the remaining heat left over in our fuel and the residual heat in the fire pit itself. One of the more interesting aspects of that sound is that it can serve not just as an aesthetic and very cute and comforting sound, but you can hear it from a good 15-20 blocks away, so if you're working elsewhere in your base and you stop hearing that sound, you know dinner is ready. And dinner is ready. Now to interact with this, we can't just eat this out of the pot. That would be very uncouth and we need to mind our manners. We need a bowl. We can either scoop it right out of the pot, which will give us a full bowl, or we could take the pot off and we could... I think we can actually pour soup into the bowl if I... There we go. So we now have two bowls of stew that has poultry and turnips in it. And this is going to give us... This doesn't stack either. It will give us 750 saturation of protein and 300 of vegetable for a total of 1050. Now we are below 450, so eating this will not fill us up the whole way, which is good because you can end up with portions of meals in bowls, and that can get annoying to handle sometimes. So we're going to go ahead and give this an eat. Ah, so much better. And now, because we had 1,000 saturation of a meal, not just regular food, our hunger bar is going to stay paused for, I believe, the next five minutes. I think it's 30 seconds per hundred, full hundred saturation in your meal. That means we can go out and we can run and chop and do all manner of crazy things and, and get hurt and heal up, and our food is not going to go anywhere. Our satiation will not go anywhere. Well, with warm food in our bellies and the sun at our back, I think it is time to say goodbye for the day. Thank you all for stopping by. My name has been Kurizar, and I will see you all in the next one.